Good morning, and welcome to our Lenten devotion for February 28th. It's good to have you with us here this morning, or if you are watching us uh, with, a, with a recording on Facebook or YouTube, as we begin our time together, we have a candle that is lit to remind us that whenever we gather in community, whether it be in person or virtually, God is with us in a special way. I want to read again to you Psalm 32. These are long readings, and these are may not be the psalms that we tend to hear very often. They're kind of hard to listen to, um, so it's helpful to read them multiple times to let them kind of sink in. So hear these words. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For night and day, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous, seeing all you who are upright in heart. I also want to read to you a portion of Genesis, often referred to as the call of Abram. Hear these words from Genesis 12, 1 through 4. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Well, if you've been around the church for a while, especially Sunday school, the story of Abram is a familiar one. He was a nomad, a wanderer. Until God caught up with him and sent him off to a new land, a land that God would show him, and there God would make of him a great nation. Great! Good for Abram, and eventually his wife, well, one of his wives, or wife among many concubines and maidservants. Her name at the time was Sarai. They were later to be known as Abraham and Sarah. But if you were an inhabitant of that land to which God was sending Abram and his entourage, it wasn't going to be something that would go so well. After all, who can stand up against someone who is sent by God Almighty to inhabit the land that you and your people have inhabited for, well, probably since there was people to inhabit the land? Once Abram and his clan arrives, there's a great conquest and, well... It's a mess, like any conquest into previously inhabited lands will be. And it makes for a great story. The problem is we tend to take great stories and want to have them play out again and again and again. So the folks from Europe who came across the Atlantic Ocean to the shores of what is now referred to as North America took the story of Abraham and politicized it, contemporized it, and it became the underlying story of Manifest Destiny. The belief that God had predestined the Europeans to basically take over the world and control everything and everybody. It's the same, same thought that would give rise to the doctrine of discovery, the doctrine that basically said it's God's desire that North America belong to Spain, except for any land not occupied by Christians. But wait, if the Christians come in and take over, well, well, yeah, you get the idea. The picture you see behind me 
is the landscape of northern San Pete County in central Utah. It's the landscape of my heritage. My ancestors homesteaded there as Mormon pioneers and missionaries to the Paiute Indians. I still have relatives that live near this area. In fact, this photo was taken as a group of my cousins and I drove up a road into the area where a grandfather used to run cattle and sheep. There are no longer any Paiutes living on this land. All that I am aware of that is left of them are a few graves that have been marked off in the Spencer Family Cemetery and some quickly fading stories about the few Indians that had lived in Indianola maybe 60, 70, or 80 years ago. I hear the words from the story of Abram through the stories of my own family that settled on a land that God had shown them, eventually dis to displace those that, who had abided there for many generations before the arrival of the settlers and the army, and the soldiers, and the explorers, and the trappers. They too believed that God had given them that land. I personally did not take the land from those who had lived there before, yet I carry the burden of knowing that their displacement contributed to my family's survival. Is this really the destiny that God has manifested for the people of the earth? I don't think so. Perhaps part of our greatest sin is to take the biblical stories of long ago and have the arrogance to think God is expecting us to repeat them in our own time and place. I don't think that's the purpose of scripture. I think the purpose of scripture is to tell the story of long ago and learn from it, both how to live and how not to live. We've learned that conquest is never good for anyone. We've learned that land is life for everyone. We've learned that cultures can coexist. We've learned that all people deserve respect and dignity. We've learned that admitting our errors is hard, but we must do it. We've learned that God is always open to hear the confessions of our hearts. I invite you this day to take some time to think about the land you will walk upon this day. Wonder about who walked on that land 100 years ago, 200 years ago. What animals moved across the land in search of food and a herd or a pack? What traditions are held within the land? What languages sweep across the grasses? What dreams soared to the stars? What hopes lay buried in unmarked graves? May your wondering lead you to recognize the sacredness of the land upon which you travel in this life. I invite you to be with me in prayer. Holy one of all people, we recognize that our journeys in life and those who have come before us have brought hardship and disaster to those who have gone before us. Bring our soaring hearts back to the earth to keep us humble before you and others. Help us recognize the descendants of those who were displaced to make room for us. And help us know them as your children. As we go into this day, may we go with peace and humility. Amen. And as we prepare to go into this day, we take our lit candle and extinguish the flame. And we see the smoke rise into the room. Let that be a reminder that God goes with us this day. Go in peace and have a blessed day.